G'day guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Caitlin and I'm an American living in beautiful Sydney, Australia. As an American, I grew up with the notion that America was the most powerful country in the world. We had the largest military, we had the most economically important alliances. I mean, there's all this stuff that you hear about how great America is when you're growing up there. Now, when I saw this video, Australia's rise to global power from the channel Hoser. I was wondering just what this was about because I know Australia is a very powerful country, but to be honest, a lot of Americans don't really think of Australia as like the top 10 when they think of the most powerful countries in the world. So let's see what this video is about, Australia rising as a global power. So grab a bicky, grab a cuppa, and let's get right into this video. Is Australia the next big thing in the world? Well, okay, I guess it's big, but I mean like, is Australia the next hot thing? Okay, you got me there too. I mean, will the last frontier be the next frontier to rise to global power? There might be a good chance, but let's talk about some of their challenges along the way, and it's not just being surrounded by animals that will kill you if you look at them strangely. First, let's actually go to the place. It sits here under the earth out of view from anybody. It's huge, it's flat, it's coastal, and it's dry. So, so dry. One third of Australia is desert and one third of it is semi-desert, making up the outback which changed the Australians from posh, manners-loving British criminals to brash, wallaby-riding bogans. Oh god, this guy's gonna be so annoying to listen to for the rest of the video. So right off the bat, you can tell the stereotypes there between the bogans, the outback, the animals trying to kill you. Uh, this is going to be a little bit frustrating, but I mean, I'm wondering exactly what this refers to in terms of global power. So I guess we'll just kind of grit our teeth and deal with this to see exactly what it is he has to say. Since they couldn't live there, the Australians huddled on the coasts into large cities. In fact, five of them make up over half the population and almost all Australians live on the east coast on the other side of those mountains, making Perth the most isolated major city on earth, so you really don't want to know what goes on there. The west was too dry, the north was too wet, the south had 100 meter tall cliffs, the interior is probably the closest thing to hell on earth there is, and the east? is actually really nice. I'm so jealous of their weather and their shining sun and their happiness and their lack of this and their- So what are these Australians in- <laughs> I mean, I gotta admit, the lack of like winter slush and all that you have to deal with is so, so nice. But I do miss snow. I know you can get snow in certain places in Australia, but I miss living in a place where it actually did snow in the winter. Um, when it gets cold, I think we're going to have to take a trip somewhere to like a little bit of a chilly area just to see a little bit of snow. I do miss it. In the east do all day, other than catch 30 meter high waves, duh, they farm. Australians never do anything small, and I mean anything, huh? and their farms are no exception, being some of the largest on earth with 55% of their land technically used for farming, although most of that farmland looks like this. <laughs> dry and wide. Why doesn't it look like this? Because of that. The Australians don't have that. Sure they have rivers, but the important ones where people live, namely the Murray-Darling Basin, which makes up over half of water consumption, are constantly at risk of drying up. Sure they have the ocean, but that doesn't do much when it's saltier than the average YouTube comment section. And the billabongs around Australia don't do much when you could be eaten alive for swimming in them. Okay, I even I know that that one's a bit of an exaggeration and I'm somebody who's terrified of crocs But even I know they're only in like the northern half of the country and Mark and I were kind of talking about where we would end up living in the next couple of years somewhere hypothetically and I brought up crocs being in Queensland and then he's like that that's not something to really worry about That's not a reason to not move somewhere is crocs. So yeah, me and my American brain still thinks that Queensland is just swimming with crocs everywhere. I know that the Northern Territory is, but in my mind, most of Queensland still has a lot of crocs in it. Water security is the first big challenge Australia will need to face, and so far they're not doing a great job. See, Australia gets wet from two main cycles, the Southern Oscillation and the Indian Ocean Dipole. Sometimes the high pressure air is over here, sometimes it's over here. How the wind works, who knows? That's only up to the most high to decide. But however it works, all you need to know is that Australia has three year cycles of being very dry and three year cycles of being very wet, scientifically named the long dry and the big wet. 
This is how rain generally comes, not by the seasons, but by the long and the wet. That's a huge problem for water security during the dry cycles, which have more recently been looking like a contest to burn the most animals possible. But the thing is, Australia has a lot of land and not a lot of people, so they make a ton of food and end up shipping it off to the world. Not a big deal, right? WRONG! Technically, with every ounce of food they ship off, they're also shipping off the water that was used to make that food, also called virtual water. And because of huge calorie exports, restrictions on foreign food and crops entering the country, and some subsidies given to farmers, it makes Australia the largest virtual water exporter on Earth. Hmm. The dr- Okay, that's a little bit of a stretch there. Obviously, the farmers factor in the water consumption and all, especially when they're talking about prices and exporting. They take all that into consideration, the water, the food, the land area. There's a lot of factors that go into it, so I'm not totally agreeing with this point here, but let's see what else he has to say. Rise continent on the planet is also technically the largest water exporter too, giving away as much as their stored water reservoir every year. That's not going to go very well when Australia gets even more dry from a changing climate and fires, droughts, dust storms rage on and river inflows dry up. The next long dries are going to feel like that. Dry and long. Did you know Australia was made when Britain couldn't send their prisoners to America anymore because of, you know, that whole thing? And they couldn't send them to Africa because the tropical diseases were seen as too harsh for even murderers to live through? So they sent them here. And then they looked around and realized there was nothing and it was kind of hard to build a city from nothing. So they gave the prisoners economic freedom to go get a bag and build this new country. There was still some beef between the ex-convicts and the elites until the 1850s in a gold rush where a monopoly was tried and failed so now anyone can go and get rich. Ugh. I guess these convicts now deserve real rights, so they got them. And boom! There's the whole colonial history of Australia with independence given in 1901. Now it's free... Oh, that is so oversimplified and slightly inaccurate and, uh, I get we're... Mm. So I've learned a lot, and I was definitely, like, a year or two ago, one of those Americans who pretty much thought exactly that. So I'm just gonna skip over this because I still don't know enough about Australian history to really give a history lesson, but even I know that a lot of that is way oversimplified and, um, slightly inaccurate equal-ish and ready to industrialize. Luckily they knew what to industrialize into. Digging! Dig, 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 dig. Australia is a massive exporter of iron, coal, gold, copper, nickel, gas, zinc, lead, manganese, aluminum, tin. Whoa! You fell asleep there. You didn't let me finish my list of metals. Titanium, uranium, silver, yeah. If it's a metal, chances are Australia probably supplies it to you, especially iron or coal. 70% of all their exports are raw materials straight from the ground, making them a little dependent on world markets for monetary stability and making all of their other economic sectors completely uncompetitive on the world stage. But who cares? They're young and they're turned and got ditches galore. Tripling the per capita income since 2000 from the investment put into mining by... Was that Beijing? Just kidding, it's mostly by the US, UK and Belgium. China is just the one who eats all of the iron. And the extra money is put into other sectors. Despite what I say, Australia is still a highly diversified rich economy. Shocking, I know. Most of that economy is based in the cities as most Australians are in fact cowards and refuse to live among the dingoes in the outback. Okay, this guy's got a really irritating sense of humor, I gotta be honest. Like, I can get where he's coming from, but most of the jokes are just so flat and again, so stereotypical and really, really annoying. Just, ugh. And the data is great. Low inflation, falling unemployment, high GDP growth, and they haven't had a recession in three decades. Yes, decades, not years. Most of the growth coming from new immigrants coming into the barren land or feeding metal to these Asian countries who seem to never get full. What about credit? Oh, there's the problem they're hiding in their perfect shiny economy. Credit has increased almost eight times since 2000, outpacing GDP which only grew by three times. Almost all of the new credit grew from housing. 
Australia might be sprawling, but it's incredibly dense in the places where people actually want to live with more and more immigrants coming into the port cities where housing can't really spread outwards, raising the price of a bunga bungalow. And the tax code forces Australians to get addicted to buying more and more housing. They have something called negative gearing, which isn't what Lance Armstrong did when he got caught. Instead, it's essentially when you buy a house or land so that it goes down in value and you cut it off your tax bill. About 20% of Australians have an extra property for investing. Rich guys, I respect it, they just want to make some money, but the main consequence is Perth being the most affordable major city in Australia. By the way, Perth was also in the top 20 most unaffordable cities on earth in 2021. Okay, so what are some of the most unaffordable? Because I see a few Australia and the US popping up on here. So number two is Sydney. Okay. Then we have San Jose, California, Melbourne, Australia. Okay. Honolulu, San Francisco. Those make sense. They're fairly isolated. LA. Yeah, that's pretty ridiculous. San Diego, Miami. I get that. Adelaide, though, is more unaffordable than Perth, though, according to this list. And what I don't get, number 19, just as an American, the USA, New York, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. The, mm, are you talking about New York City? Because that's just in New York. And if you're talking about New York, that's an entire different state. And there's no reason to include New Jersey and Pennsylvania in that we are separate from New York. But anyway, I keep pointing out to Mark, maybe we should move out to Perth. I'd like to move out there. But that again, we also have no friends and family out there. And like, it's tough enough just me coming over and only having like, I've literally had one friend in New South Wales when I moved over here. So it's tough for me not having family over here and having like one friend over here in New South Wales at the time I moved. I can imagine how much more difficult it would be for us to move to a place where we have no friends, no family, no networks. Like, it would just be tough. It wouldn't be, it would still be manageable. It would just be tough. So you can imagine how the other cities are doing. It's like a country where half the population lives in LA. They might be rich, but things get expensive. So their dirty economy based on dirt and dirt, which is also pretty overcredited and hasn't had a recession in a minute, is pretty damn volatile to swings in global metal demand and housing prices. Next time they do have a recession, I wouldn't expect it to be cute like this little koala. I'd expect it to be more... <laughs> So why do I think Australia might be a growing power throughout the century? It's simple, really. They're secure. Now, young Australians may look in the mirror and feel pretty insecure about themselves, but then they'll remember. I have coal and money and food and feel a whole lot better about themselves. They're the main supplier of raw materials to Asia. They're like an English coal miner slapped in the middle of Asia, or on the outside, I guess. And because of that, the UK and much, much, much more importantly, the US loves to work with them. Oh God, this guy's cringy. This video is cringy, but you also have to remember it works the other way around. It's one thing if you're the one that's importing or sorry, exporting all this stuff over to Asia, but what happens if those Asian countries don't want to work with you anymore and you're just sitting on all this raw material that you've spent an absolute fortune digging up and you can't really sell it to anybody or you have to sell it for a lot less than it actually costs in order to dig it up out of the ground because the countries that you were sending it to before suddenly don't want it. Just, mm. Yeah, it, that's a two-way street importing and exporting. So yeah, not necessarily um, a huge reason I could see Australia becoming a global power, like a global power to the same level as like the US and China and England and Russia. Like, nah, mm. it's a big country. There's a lot to it, but I can't see it becoming like a huge global power, to be honest. Australia is in pretty much every Pacific defense treaty the US and friends make and they are huge suppliers of weapons and military technology to each other. The day the Americans abandon the Australians is the day the Americans switch from God loving freedom to the metric system. The people who say Australia is going to have to choose between the US and China one day are wrong. Australia has already chosen the US. China is only one of their buyers, a pretty big one, but it's still only one of them. If China slows down in growth and demand for ground sludge falls, maybe from their anciently aged population or insane lockdowns, the Aussies surely will too. But they still have India and Southeast Asia to sell to who are ready to grow and don't seem to be bothered with environmental ethics. And if they slow down exporting or making Tim Tams and Roo sausages to keep some of their water drinkable, they can get some extra food from New Zealand who seems to be the identical twin of Australia except with mining switched to agriculture. 
Plus, Australia will never, ever, ever run out of energy having some of the <laughs> the largest coal reserves. And whenever that gets too unpopular for energy, it's legitimately the best place on earth to put solar and wind farms in the empty, cloudless, flat outback. Cheap, abundant, and practically free energy could mean more manufacturing at home. Why not make some steel plants being a massive exporter of the two main materials, iron and coal after all? Steel factories are good for young boys. I remember my first molten steel spill. Yup, turned me into a man. God, that is like terrifying, not just the Photoshop picture, but that is, oof, God. They definitely have the room to grow and let more blokes in, especially in smaller towns being one of the least densely populated, most desolate countries on earth. That's why they'll have a great future. They're small and rich and vast with room to grow and everything they need they have and it's so just a couple minutes ago, he was saying that all the immigrants that are coming over are living in the bigger cities, which yes, that makes sense. I live in Western Sydney. I'd love to live a lot closer to the CBD and the beach, but work-wise, it does make more sense for us to be here right now. But he was just saying that they can't really expand outwards at this point, that they're kind of limited to where they're at. And then he's saying that there's room for them to grow. Nobody wants to go live in the middle of rural Australia. It's a very small percentage of people who do. I got news for you. And the immigrants that are coming over, they're not thinking about going to rural Australia. A lot of them are thinking about going to the big cities. So it's only adding more population to these incredibly already overpopulated and incredibly dense cities. It just doesn't work. It's... There needs to be a balance. There really isn't that much room for Australia's population to grow. They are, if, even if there isn't limited resources to a degree, there's very limited space before you get to the point where you're reaching out into the areas that are basically unlivable. So he basically just completely contradicted himself in this, but okay, a couple more seconds left. It's secure. Food, materials, energy, capital, defense, just not water unless you're talking gnarly waves. It's boring, it's slow growth, and it's not exciting per se, but exciting for a country usually means something like... Uh, I gotta be honest, I normally like most of the videos that I watch and react to. This one, it, this one was actually tough to get through. It was very, very cringy. The jokes were annoying. It's full of stereotypes. I don't necessarily agree with his points. I don't think Australia is necessarily a global power, or at least it's not going to be in like one of the top 10 global powers ever. Overall, it was just a frustrating video to watch. I don't necessarily agree with a lot of his points. I feel like he doesn't also understand much about Australia outside of the stereotypes. But anyway, that's it for this video, you guys. It definitely wasn't one that I particularly enjoyed. Let me know if you guys enjoyed it down below. It's definitely not one of my favorites, but you know, I'd say you learned a little something new, but I feel like I absolutely learned nothing from this video. But anyway, it is what it is. I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, please hit the like and subscribe button down below. It really, really does help support me and help support the channel. My neighbor's dog would also love it if you subscribed and liked this video. That's it for this video, you guys. I will see you all in the next one.